Praise the Lord. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Praise God. Well, um, it's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. As I was saying, for those who remembered, um, of the, the next few weeks, we're just going to be doing different subjects until we start the new year where we'll go be back on through a book, probably, or a theme um, in the new year in our Bible studies. And uh, the couple of things I wanted to speak about, one of them tonight is uh, I'm going to speak about money. Um, so people think sometimes in church, well, you shouldn't mention money or you shouldn't talk about money. Well, I've done a little study and a little um, add up and... Um, Prayer in the Bible, obviously, is a very, very, very big subject. Uh, it's mentioned about 500 times. Faith, <clears throat> very, very big subject. It's mentioned about 500 times. Money and what to do with it is mentioned 2,000 times in the Bible. So if it's that much in the Bible, I think we do need to talk about it in the church. It's not something we should be latched of, it's nothing we should be frightened of, but we should know that God is interested in money. And I don't mean he's interested in saving money, he's interested in your money, but he knows what kind of hold or power over a person's life money can have. That's right. And that's why he speaks about it so much. Now first off, just before we go into our Bible study, you've got to remember this about money. We take up an offering here on a Sunday morning, which is tithes and offerings, we call it. And that comes into the church. We pay the bills with it. Um, whatever needs to be bought, we support missions. or so We support. We buy other church buildings, mostly, uh, with the money that's in this church that's given. Mostly we buy other church buildings or we buy a tent or something like that. And it's to support the missions, uh, not only in this country, but around the world. But what money can't buy is salvation. No matter how much money you give, you could, you could come on a Sunday morning and you could get £50 million and you'd, it would leave you penniless and you give it all in the church, it still wouldn't give you one hour's salvation. It wouldn't even give you a second salvation because it's too precious to buy. You'd have all the money and all the gold and all the diamonds in the world, it won't buy a second of salvation. It was paid for by the lifeblood of Jesus Christ. It was the only payment for sin. It's the only payment that redeems. It's the only payment that we can be saved by. But the Bible does speak very plainly about us, me and you, parting with the money. Parting with the money. Now it speaks a lot about what we should do with the money in our own lives as well. And I'll be speaking a little about that. But I want to speak about why we take up a tithe and offering and what a tithe and offering should be as a Christian. Um, so how... And when should we give? The Bible says this in 1 Corinthians 16. You can read it with me. Verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 verse 1. <clears throat> now if you remember as we were going through the Bible studies um, through the year. A lot of the epistles, the church letters. Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians. They were what we call circular letters. So they were sent. We know that the, the church of Ephesus re reached, re received <coughs> the book of Ephesians, but it wasn't just left there, it was given to other churches. The book of Corinthians was passed on there and given to other churches. It's 1 Corinthians 16 verse 1. Now about the collection for the saints, you should do the same as I instructed the Galatian churches. It's already a teaching that Paul is giving out in other churches. On the first day of the week, does anybody know what the, day, the first day of the week is? Sunday. It's a Sunday. On the first day of the week, each of us is to set something aside and save it in keeping with how he prospers. That's like a percentage, how he prospers. So that no collections will be need to be made when I come. So the Bible speaks here about regularly giving on a Sunday with a percentage. In keeping with your income. You get more, you should give more, you give less, you can give less. That's how God sees it. Um, how should we do it? Well, obviously, we take up an offering in the bag, but there's more than just that. And um, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 1, now this is not just speaking about giving in the church, but I think it's about speak, giving in general in our lives. Matthew chapter 6. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. 
So when you give to the needy, so it's all about parting with money, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Now that's a, a little line. You know, we usually think announce it with trumpets like you go, look what he's given. Well, it was actually, there was, uh, it, was like, it looked like a trumpet. It was a, 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 it was a funnel where they would make the offering that would go down. So it would make a noise as it jangled down. So if it was a, lots more coins, it would make more. There was no paper money then. So it was a lot more coins. It would be a lot more jangling. So they would throw it in to announce how much they were given. That's what Jesus was speaking about. As the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honoured by others. The reason, one of the wrong reasons for giving is to be honoured by others. He says, truly I have told you they have received their reward in full. And then he tells us exactly how to give. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving may be in secret. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So in this church, and like in many other churches, we have a bag that goes around and nobody can see what you're putting in. It's between you and God and you put it in and it's done in secret. And so that's the basis of giving is biblical a percentage for all, not just for men, not just for women, but for all people. Everybody receives something, we should give. And if you don't receive something, so you have not on a wage, you should not get paid or anything, but you have money in your hands and then you should make it, the Bible talks about tithes and offerings is what we take up in this church. Something that you offer to God. So man or woman, should every man and woman should be giving something to God, offering a part of them, you know, and especially for many of us, I won't say all, but many of us, we have to be careful with money because it, it has such a hold of our life and it's a thing that we get greedy with. Now we usually condemn people in, 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 in different kinds of sin. So we look like uh, sexual immorality and different kinds of sin, we look at it terrible. But the Bible says a greedy person will not enter the kingdom of heaven. A greedy person will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And who can we be greedy towards anybody else but to God himself? And so when we give, we have to be careful that God doesn't need our money. This church doesn't need your money. But we need to part with our money for our own heart's sake. That we don't become greedy and it doesn't corrupt us as well. And the Bible says there, when we give... It be given like this. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. So can you buy the blessings of God? You can't buy. If you set out to buy the blessings of God, you can't buy them. But God does bless the giver. It's about the heart. You know, if you're going to think, oh, you know what? I'm going to give him more money and I'm going to really get blessed this week. It ain't going to work. Just as we freely give unto God because we love him, not because we're trying to buy something. That's what God blesses. It's the intent of the heart. Like everything that will be judged one day, the Bible says that we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and everything we have ever done, in fact, it says good or bad will be judged. The word good there obviously is good, but the word bad there means useless things. And so every useless thing, that means if you give money, you've, give, right, you've, you've got the bags coming round. Imagine this scene. Bags coming round. Put your hand in your pocket. 60 bar, get in there. But we've done it so everybody else can see it. No reward. No reward. Because the Bible says here that Jesus said, you've reserved your reward, people say, oh, he gives 60 pounds this week. And remember, if you're going to give a tenth, that means you've had 600 pounds this week, that means you've had less than 100 pounds a day. And most people, not all, but most people get more than that nowadays. Just so you know. So why should we give? Well, I've spoken a little bit about it already, but we need to break the, the greed over our lives. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 12, you can read it with me. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but also overflowing in many acts of thanksgiving to God. We do it to buy churches. We do it to support missions. We do it to feed the homeless. We do it to preach the gospel, to keep the general running of the church of Jesus Christ here upon the earth. Now the Bible says God owns the cattle and the thousand mills. He owns everything anyway. He doesn't need money. But it's me and you that need to learn to give because that's what becomes a God in so many of our lives. 
And Jesus spoke, well, the Bible speaks specifically about it, like I said, 2,000 times. But he said this, and this is a, a verse that's very important for us. You cannot love God and mammon. You cannot love God and mammon. And the Bible actually says this in the next line, which most people miss out. Because you will love one and you will hate the other. You will hate the other. Not like your life, you'll 50-50 them. But God knows our heart. And if we love money, we will hate God. And so that's very important to understand. <clears throat> Lots of people say, you know, I want, my, I want my giving to be biblical. I want it to be based on the scriptures. And the argument is this. And we don't command anybody. We don't say in here, you know, if you don't give 10%, you're not a Christian. If you don't give 10%, you're an evil person. No, it's between you and God. We tell you what the Bible says, but it's between you and God. How you give and when you give. We don't you know, say, you know, oh, they're not a very good Christian because they don't give 10%. That's between you and God. But we have to tell you what the Bible says. And if you want your giving to be just right, because people say, oh, well, tithing was for the Jews that was under the law. And we're not under law anymore. We're under grace, so we don't have to give. Well, that's not exactly true. If you want to be all biblical... Uh, to be biblical giving then look with me to Mark chapter 12 and verse 42 because this is biblical New Testament giving that's under the ministry of Jesus Christ and what Jesus said was he commended in giving he, that means he agreed and it was good and he actually supported this kind of giving Mark 12 and verse 42 it says this and a poor widow came and dropped in two tiny coins worth very little Summoning his disciples, he said to them, I assure you, the poor widow has put in more than all of his giving to the temple treasury. For they all give out of their surplus, but she gave it our poverty, has put in everything she possessed, all she had to live on. So you can say, like Lady Astor, uh, it wasn't Lady Astor, it was, a, it, was a, it was a next woman down to Lady Astor. She went to a Church of England church, and as she, she was coming out, there was a plate there next to the vicar, and it was to collect money. You've seen it in the church, you've been to funerals and weddings and there's a plate there and then you can put money in as you go and come. And she said, look, vicar, the widow's might. And she gave a pound. He said, actually, the widow gave two mites. So she looked at him, opened the person and gave a pound. And he went, no, actually, she gave all she had. <laughs> and she, she just walked on. But you see, if you want your biblical, to be a biblical giver, give it all. Give everything, and that's what was commended by Jesus Christ. But that isn't a command. That's just a New Testament, what happens to somebody in the Bible. But there's plenty of, like I started with, that we should give a percentage weekly. That's exactly what the Bible says. On the first day of the week, give a sum in keeping with your income. In Acts 2, 44, it says this. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all as anyone in need. When somebody says to me, oh, I don't have to tithe, I'm a New Testament giver. Well, okay, say, well, give it all and share it with everybody else because that's what happened in the New Testament. And so there's a pattern given right from the beginning of the Bible, right until today, there's a pattern given. And it's, we start in Genesis 14. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. The word Genesis comes from the Greek word, from the Hebrew words, it means in the beginning. Genesis 14, verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest to God most high. He blessed him and said, Abraham is blessed by God most high, creator of heaven and earth. And I give praise to God most high, who was handed over your enemies to you. And Abram gave him a tenth of Everything. Matizigdek was the high priest in Jerusalem at the time. What verse was that? It's in Genesis 14, 18. Yes. And so after Abraham won this great battle and he collected all the goods, he gave a tenth to the priesthood. Now that was before, just so anybody knows, there was no law then. The law wasn't given until after the, the next third book down. And so this is before the law, and God had put it in Abraham's heart, because there was no, God, Abraham didn't have a Bible. He didn't have nothing to read to tell him what to do. But between him and God, God had put it in his heart to give him a tenth of everything, before there was any instruction. In Genesis 28, when you get down to Jacob, 
Then Jacob made a vow, if God will be with me and watch over me on his journey, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. He will be my God. This stone that I have set up a market for God's house, and I will give you a tenth of all that you give me. So Jacob said, everything that you give me, I'm going to give you a tenth back of everything. And that was a pattern started way before any law in between God and man. Under the believers of the one true and living God, they, what God had put that seed in the heart, had paid a tithe. Under the law, we find out who the tithe really belongs to, who the tithe belongs to. It says in Leviticus 27, verse 30, Every tenth of the land produce, grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belonging to the Lord, it is holy to the Lord. The tenth, you know, if you give 10%, if you, if you have, go out tomorrow and you earn £100, and you decide in your heart to give £10 to God, it actually belongs to God already. The Bible says the tenth actually belongs to God. It's his. You know, and if you think about it, he's given us everything we have anyway. You know, as we've gone out there today and you've had a deal, you've done a job, or you've worked for something, you've done something, you've got to pay at the end. It's all given from God. So we're actually receiving 90% and only giving back 10% of actually what is this. And Jesus talked about it to the scribes and Pharisees in the New Testament. In Matthew 23, I'm going to look at Matthew 23, 23. And Jesus was at a great odds all the time with the scribes and the Pharisees. They were the holy men of the time. And all the time through the, Jesus' ministry on the earth, um, that, that three years of ministry, it was, it was a constant battle with these people. They were trying to pick faults in him and he was trying to show them the way. He loved them so much. And he was trying to show them the way. And uh, they believed that by fulfilling the law, just by keeping the law of 613 commands that Moses had given, that they were right with God. Now the Bible says that the law is powerless to save. You cannot be saved by the law. The law was only given for one reason, to show that we are sinners, to show that we are lawbreakers, to point us to Jesus Christ. That's why the law was given. And so they thought, you know, we, we, we're doing good here. We, we're the holy people. We, we give a tenth of everything. This is what Jesus said to them. Woe, which means a warning. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you pay a tenth of mint, dill and cumin. Now, that was of the herbs. They would have small garden boxes outside in the gardens or on the garden box, and they would grow herbs and spices, the same as people do today. And every tenth of that, they would still bring that to the, the priesthood and they would give it a tenth. He said, you, you know, they would, take, they would take the little tiniest letter of the law, even in the wrong spirit, and try and make it fit. And I'll tell you what I mean by that, and it's still today. As many as you know who have been to Israel or you've heard me speak about it before. If you go to Israel today, you can't have meat and dairy on the same table. So if you're having beef dinner, which you can because it's kosher, you can't have a cup of tea with any milk in it. Because of this law, listen carefully to the law. The Bible says that, um, that a kid should not be boiled in his mother's milk. So it's a baby lamb or a baby goat. They shouldn't take the milk and boil it to make some kind of stew out of the milk because it would be uh, like, like we have problems with swine flu and things like that today. It was unclean. So they took it from that thinking this, that if you've got meat and milk on the same plate, a drop of the hot milk might fall out of the cup, land on the piece of beef and cook it. That's the hypocrisy and they were doing things like they were putting burdens, the Bible says they were putting burdens on men's shoulders that they couldn't even keep themselves, saying this is the letter of the law, this is how we should. And they were exaggerating the law to make themselves look great. So they were saying, hey, listen, you know, I'm going to even give a tenth of my mint. Jesus said this. You pay a tenth of your mint, dill and cumin, yet you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Jesus spoke about in other areas, about honouring your mother and father and all the great things of the law. Justice, mercy and faith. These things should have been done. So he said, you should have paid your tithes. These things should have been done without neglecting the others. And we can actually fall into the same trap today. We can say, you know what, I'm going to pay my tithes. I'm going to give a good offering this week because I've had a good week. I'm going to really give unto God. 
But it doesn't matter if I've lived like a pig or I've, I've been horrible to my wife or husband. No, Jesus said, it's okay doing that. That's good to do that. But don't forget the big things. Don't forget how to live. Don't think that just by putting our money in the bag is going to make us right with God. We should put our money in the bag, but what makes us right with God is living for God. Because we can't buy salvation. We can't pay for it. Not under command, but joyfully. Not because you have to, because we want to. Amen. That's a very important teaching. And that's why we don't say, you know, if you don't give 10%, you're not a Christian. No, it's because it has to be from your heart. It has to be a joy for you to give your tithe unto God. It's a mindset, really. It's realizing that God has given us everything we need. And we, he's given us the 90%. And all we have to give back is the 10%. Mm. We would be crying if we were keeping the 10% and giving the 90% back. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it says this. Remember this. So when, you, when God's word says remember this, it's an important thing. The person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart. Not reluctantly. Not of necessity. Now there's that word, not of necessity. Not because you think you're going to get saved by giving the 10%. For God loves a cheerful giver. We should be joyful to give only 10% back of the 100% that God has given us. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you. That, that, you know what that means? It means this. It means you're right, you've got your £100. Pound, you've, you've earned your £100 today, so you're going to give £10 into the offering today because it's the only day you've worked. And you put in your £10. And you might think, oh, you know what? I've only got £90 pound left. I'm not going to... He says here... And God is able to make every grace overflow to you. Let me just tell you something about giving unto God. God is no man's debtor. He's no man's debtor. And I'll tell you, I would rather have, I'd rather have 90 pounds blessed by God than 100 pounds that isn't. Because it will go much further. That's what Jesus means there. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you. He said, in every way, of always having everything that you need, always having everything that you need, you may excel in every good work. It's all this. He is the Lord of every area of our lives. And so we've learned tonight about giving. How much should we give? When should we give? How we should give? Okay. Well, thank you. There's somebody that agrees. Siri agrees with me. <laughs> What's the options that we hold on and we are greedy towards God that we think, you know what? No, I just can't part with this. I've had a very good week. I've had £10,000 this week. So I have to give a £1,000. Oh, big ask. And we are all done to that. That Bible says that, that, that if that was the case, then we'd be loving the money. We wouldn't be able to part with it. So actually, it hinges on, it goes on to idolatry where we, we worship man. Because we won't let go of this. The Bible says this in 1, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It's not the root of all evil. It's the root of all kinds of evil. And by craving it, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. The Jews that was in the Old Testament, they were accused of robbing God. And in Malachi 3, 7, he said, How have you robbed God? By holding back your tithes. Now that was under the law, I know. But the concept is there. Giving freely to God releases us. But it also releases the blessings in our lives. Proverbs eleven twenty four says, One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another with all's unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And so, is that the only kind of giving that we should do? No. That's when we give our offering in the church on a Sunday morning. That belongs to God. That's to give to God. But as Christians, God also wants to use us here upon the earth. To bless others with material things. In 1st John, that's little John, chapter 3 and verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, he has no, but has no pity on him, 
then how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and truth. Amen. What a beautiful line at the end of that. Dear friend, dear children, not let us love with just words, but with speech, actions and in truth. Because if not, we'll just be like the cursed men of the Bible that will store up wealth for ourselves. The Bible says that we should be rich towards God. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth in Matthew 6, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasures, there your heart will be also. So if your treasure is in the wallet, that's what you're holding back, that's where our heart will be. And that's why it's, it should be talked about in church. That's why Jesus spoke. That's why God's word says it 2,000 times compared to prayer and faith 500 times. It's such an important thing over our lives. And I'm going to close there, but just to remind you what the love of money can do. The Bible says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. But you know, and, and the brother quoted it at the seminar, for those who were at the seminar, and it was J.R. who told me, J.R. Jeffries, he's preached here before from America, he's from the church in um, Baton Rouge, in Louisiana. And uh, he said, when we were, our families, were, he said, when my dad was first there in America, they came from England, and they went to live there, he said, we were very, very, very poor. He said, so poor, he said, one time, he said, we had to sell the tyres off one car, shift the trailer with the other car and then hitchhike back with the four wheels of that car to move the other trailer. That's how poor they were. He said, that's only one generation ago. He said, but we got over that, got into work, got over that. He said, and then when the money came, he said, drink. A lot of them got involved in drink, like, like it was a lot. Still isn't a, uh, some breeds of people now, but when I was younger, men used to drink seven nights a week, twice on a Sunday. It was a big, big thing. There, was, there seemed to be a lot more drunks then than there is now. He said, and we got into drink in a big way. He said, but we got over that. He said, but then drugs came. Among the travellers and rummy in America, there is two drug rehabilitation houses just for travellers that's run 365 days a year. Just for travellers because it's such a big problem over there for drugs. He said, let me just tell you something, it's nearly killing our people, he said. He said, we've got people that's been destroyed by drugs all over the country. He said, but you know what? That's not the biggest thing. He said, something has come now that's killed them off completely. Mm. He said, it's money. Right. He said, it's sent them absolutely divvy. He said, they don't know who they are anymore. They don't know what they are anymore. They want to be something else. They want to do something else. They want to appear to be something else, like something that they're not. Because they want to give off this aura to everybody else that I've arrived mm -hmm. because I have money. Let me just tell you something. It all belongs to God. Amen. And you know, all we have, you know how much we're taking when we go down that hole unless we get wrapped, you know how much we're taking with us? Nothing. nothing. In this world we came with nothing and we'll be leaving exactly the same way. I just encourage you, be rich towards God and God will abundantly bless your life because that's what the Bible says. You can't buy that blessing. But he sees the heart of a man and woman who wants to build the kingdom of God who will be a sacrificial giver unto God, who will share what they have to others to build the kingdom of God. When you put money in this purse when on a Sunday morning, or when you go to a homeless people in the street and you give them five pounds, whatever it might be, it's showing that it's no longer controlling your life, but you're using the money to be a blessing. Because let me just tell you something. And I've said this in this church a thousand times, and I mean that right. It's a great, great tool, this money. But it's a terrible master. Amen. It will destroy us. That's why we need to be generous towards God. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord.